Okay. You okay. Good? okay, so as much as possible, just continue to look at me okay. uh, eyeball to eyeball. And, you know, mm -hmm. I know it's completely artificial, but actually the less you look into the lens, the better. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, because then you don't look shifty eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and do we have a good sound level or should we? Let's see if I... Could you just count to 10 for us, please? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. All right, perfect. And we do have the boom mm -hmm. on a separate channel? Yes, we do. Great, okay. Mm -hmm. so, um, so if you would, just for our transcribers, we're going to transcribe uh -huh. the interview, just start off by telling us your name and the spelling and also how you want to be identified in the lower third. For okay. Uh, my name is Starhawk, uh, capital S-T-A-R-H-A-W-K, and you can identify me as an author, activist, permaculture designer and teacher, uh, director of Earth Activist Trainings. Okay, I, I doubt we could fit all of that yeah, in. So if you had, pick to, pick, choose, if right? you had to pick one or two, just Say, author, activist, or? Yeah, author, activist, permaculture, uh, teacher. Okay, great. Permaculturalist. Yes, but permaculturalist. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Great. Okay. So, you, I don't know if you even looked through the notes that I sent about huh. uh, you know the, the the stuff that I want to talk about, but mm -hmm. my film is about youth rites of passage and mentorship, uh -huh. you know, and how essential that is. And so, I, I'm curious to start with who initiated you. <laughs> Well, I had the traditional Jewish and, and again, initiation. Look at me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I had the traditional initiation. I had a bat mitzvah when I was 13. And uh, when I had it, it was, it was fairly common uh, for girls to get bat mitzvah in my generation. In my mother's generation, girls didn't do that. It was only for boys. And even though in some ways you don't think of that as a rite of passage, uh, considering I had to get up, make a speech in front of a bunch of people, uh, sing in public, and lead prayers, it actually turned out to be the perfect preparation for my future life. <laughs> so as an author, uh, as someone who's written a lot about goddess spirituality and earth-based spirituality, who lectures all the time, who leads public rituals, uh, that was a perfect kind of preparation. Yeah, wonderful. Well, and I'm curious, you know, how much, if any, transformational impact did it have on your life? I'm not sure whether the bat mitzvah had like a great transformational impact. Um, it was more a culmination, you know, in our synagogue you had to actually go to synagogue, you had to study, you had to uh, do a certain amount of preparation for it. So. It was more, in that sense, like a graduation than, you know, like a Native American initiation or something that personally transforms you. Okay. Um, For me, the more transformational initiations came later in life when I got involved in goddess spirituality and got initiated into that tradition. And that is more of an experience that you go through, that you prepare for, and that puts you through personal changes. Talk more about that. I mean, uh, you know, how, well, whatever you want to say about it. I uh -huh. mean, you know, to what was involved, to how transformationally impactful it was. Uh, in reclaiming, which is our tradition of the craft, uh, what we ask people to do is to go through a certain number of challenges. This actually developed after I was initiated, but we kind of formalized a process that seemed to happen informally where somebody will ask for initiation and from people who they're close to, who know them well, and we'll give them a series of challenges. And those challenges could range from, you know, study three different spiritual traditions and learn something from them and attend their ceremonies, or it could be something like, uh, grow food and eat it, or it could be something like, uh, you know, uh, one person I challenged to learn to drive, <laughs> right? 
uh, you know, it's really tailored to the person. And then when they fulfill those challenges, uh, they, their initiation team creates a ritual for them. And that process, I think, is deeply transformative for people, uh, especially if you give yourself over to people who know you really well, <laughs> then they do find challenges which for you uh, are specifically um, the things that are going to push you to your particular edge. Even though, I mean, one person I challenged to spend three nights alone in the wilderness, and it took her about 10 years, right? <laughs> to get to the point to do that. And that's something for a lot of people, that'd be the easiest thing in the world to do. But for her to be able to do that and organize it and get there, it required her to completely get into a different relationship with the physical world. And, and let's talk about mentorship, for example. I mean, mm -hmm. who were some key mentors in your life and, 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 are, uh, and how important is that concept in your sort of everyday work? You know, I've had both spiritual mentors and you could say educational mentors or um, mentors in terms of my writing uh, who've been very important to me. Uh, one of whom was my first editor, Marie Cantlon, uh, who not only edited the manuscripts but really taught me a lot about how you structure a book and how you put things together and really worked very closely in a way that Today, it's hard to find anyone in the publishing world who does that kind of editing and development with writers. And I've also had spiritual mentors. Uh, I learned a lot from a man named Victor Anderson, who was here in the Bay Area, and his wife, Cora Anderson, who were involved in what they called the fairy tradition of Wicca. And Victor was kind of a shaman. <laughs> in a way, a sort of a working class shaman, you could say, who lived in San Leandro. He was based pretty much blind, um, so he didn't get to spend a lot of time himself out in nature, but he really had a kind of intuitive understanding of a lot of the mystical and spiritual aspects of the craft and uh, wild stories. You know, it was never easy to tell whether his stories were something he'd made up or something he'd been handed down to him from some tradition or something he'd read in a book and then incorporated into, you know, but they were always fascinating and they always kind of led you into interesting places. Um, feel free to go ahead and just reframe uh, yeah. whenever I ask questions. Sure. Um, I, I, I'm curious if you could speculate for a moment on how your life might have been different if you had something along the lines of those later life mm -hmm. initiations, but when you were still a teen. I think for me, if I'd been able to have a kind of initiation as a teenager uh, that really was about pushing it to your edge, uh, it would have been a really wonderful um, probably a very affirmative experience um, because when I was growing up there really wasn't anything like that and if there was it cer there certainly wasn't anything for girls uh, and later in life I kind of found that myself when I got involved in the feminist movement uh, in the early 70s for me part of it was just getting in touch with aspects of my body I'd never been encouraged to get in touch with as a girl like strength, you know, and endurance, and the wilderness, and I loved all that. I craved all that as a child, but I didn't come from a family that ever went camping or encouraged any of that. So uh, I would very much love to have had that kind of initiation. Sweet, yeah. Today, uh, go ahead. the initiations we do for young girls, uh, we do something when they have their first menstruation. We do a first blood ceremony. And we take the girl and her mother out to some wild place, sometimes the beach, sometimes one of the hills around here, tie their hands together with a red cord, and they run together. And they run as far as the mother can run. 
And when she can't run any further, we cut them apart and let the daughter run on alone. And then we go back to someone's house and spend the afternoon telling stories about our own menstruations, about sexuality, about all those women's mysteries, and uh, giving her gifts and giving her presents. And uh, in the end, we have a feast uh, that the men prepare of red foods uh, that we think is really important for girls to know that this aspect of their physicality, of their uh, women's bodies, is something that men can honor and men can appreciate, and not something to be ashamed of, not something to be hidden. Great. So, well, since you're talking about that, go ahead and tell us a little bit about what you've seen in terms of the impact of these ceremonies on the young, the young girls, the young women. I think for the young girls, you know, sometimes it's challenging because the overarching culture is ashamed of all that. But I think for our young girls, uh, the experience gives them a sense of confidence and a sense of pride in their bodies. Uh, and I know I've seen some of the girls who went through this when they were teenagers, who now are adults and now are grown up and who love to come and be part of the ceremonies for the next generation. Nice. So, so there is a community aspect, too, to these ceremonies, yes? Where they yeah. Speak more about that. Yeah, this, the ceremonies that we do are very much part of a community, and a lot of them are involved in helping the teenagers integrate into the community, be celebrated by the community, and honored by the community. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's essential. Um, talk about, well, actually, I'd love to hear your definition of a healthy rite of passage and why you think they're necessary. I think a healthy rite of passage is something that honors a shift in life that's important. Uh, ritual is one way of saying something is really important. You know, something's worth focusing on, something's worth celebrating. And those changes that we go through in puberty, those changes in our body that change from childhood to adulthood, I think is a really important threshold. If we can celebrate it and honor it, then uh, it helps kids to make that transition, that sometimes scary, sometimes exciting transition from, oh, I can look to everybody else to take care of me, to oh, I'm one of the people that's supposed to be taking care of everybody else. I also think a good rite of passage involves a challenge. It involves some kind of a trial, something that pushes you to an edge, that forces you to confront some aspect of yourself you might not have confronted, uh, something that involves a little bit of risk and danger because it's in confronting those things and surmounting those things I think that we build that sense of confidence and that sense of self-esteem. Without that, I think kids go find their own <laughs> forms of danger and their own forms of um, passages, and often they end up very destructive. Well, let's go there. Let's talk mm -hmm. about that. I mean, you know, let's compare a healthy rite of passage yeah. to what, what are called rites of passage in our society today. You know? Yeah, I think... A healthy rite of passage, uh, like I said, involves some risk and involves some danger, um, but it also involves a lot of community support. And it's about transitioning into a place of greater responsibility. I think the unhealthy rites of passage that we have in our society often are involved with something like drinking or drugs or so, you know, something that allows you to escape responsibility, something that's about finding deeper levels of oblivion, you know, or just sheer flat-out rebellion, which, you know, I'm not anti-rebellion, <laughs> but, uh, or maybe I would say I was plenty rebellious myself, but now that I'm older, maybe I'm more on the other side of responsibility versus just flat-out rebellion. Uh, but I think rebellion sometimes can be really helpful when you're actually facing 
oppressive power and oppressive situations. Um, but when you're just constantly in a state of reaction to any authority or to uh, any kind of structure, then I think it leaves young people without what they need to get through life. And what they need now is a lot of persistence, a lot of ability to set a vision, pick a goal, and follow it, and to overcome obstacles. Um, because life is not easy for young people today. It's not, there are very few places today where a young person can just go to school, do what's expected, get a good job, raise a family, you know, follow that nicely laid out track. They don't exist anymore. Our society is coming apart at the seams on every level. And our environment, our you know, physical world is coming apart at the seams on every level. So young people who are going to survive these days are going to need to have a lot of resilience, a lot of creativity, a lot of ability to be self-starters and self-motivators. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, how do you distinguish between the healthy rite of passage and, and hazing? You know, because, you know, we have fraternities that do hazing. I mean, they have the whole this story now with this NFL football team. You know, there's a hazing mm -hmm. of one of the athletes on the team. Do you, what, what, do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, to me, a healthy rite of passage is supported, and it's supported in giving people challenges that are really designed to help them grow in some way, to benefit them in some way. And those challenges are given with support and with care, you know, for safety. Uh, you know, there needs to be some element of risk and danger involved, but we, you know, if we're doing an initiation or we're doing a rite of passage, uh, we try to make sure that there are actually supports in place, you know, so that that danger doesn't become life-threatening. Uh, or maybe it seems like danger, but somebody's actually like over in the next tree in case something really does happen. Uh, and hazing is very different than that. Hazing, I think, is really about um, inducting people into a system of power and status. Uh, it says, we have more power than you do, and you are now uh, under our control. And it has an element sometimes of sadism or of, um, you know, it's a, a, gaining amusement at somebody else's discomfort or distress. And to me, that's not part of a true initiation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really well said. Um, I'm just, just mm -hmm. thinking about whether I want to follow that thought or not. Uh, you know, to my way of thinking, in, in, a, in the broadest sense, there's sort of two categories of initiation in a way. There's sort of the culturally specific ones, mm -hmm. and obviously indigenous people have been doing it on the planet for 40, 50,000 years, you know? And then there's what you might call secular ones, mm -hmm. the ones that sort of anybody could do, or somebody who has rejected their culturally specific one needs to still be initiated, and so they could come to those. I, I'm curious, first of all, if those categories make sense to you, and, and if how you would uh, distinguish different kinds of rites of passage? I guess I would say there are certainly traditional rites of passage in intact societies or in societies maybe that aren't intact but that have some kind of unbroken continuity of tradition. And I think people who grow up in those societies and are able to go through that are very lucky. I work a lot in uh, with young people in the African-American community. And sometimes I have a Senegalese friend of mine, an artist named Charles Dabo. Um, he comes and shares his initiation. And in his tribe in Africa, you know, the young people were taken off for a month, you know, and instructed and taught all the things that they needed to know uh, to become adults and become functioning members of the tribe. And uh, that, I think, would be a wonderful experience for young people to have. 
It would also be a, young, a wonderful ex it would also be a wonderful experience for young people's parents to have to have somebody else take them off at that difficult age and instruct them and teach them what they need to know. Uh, somebody who ha just has different patterns of behavior and interaction. It could be very powerful. But most of us don't come from societies like that. And I think it's quite possible that we can create our own kinds of rites of passage. Like I said, we've done that in my community for our young girls. We also do something similar for our young boys when they reach puberty. Um, but I think those traditions also are something, you know, we can create them. They aren't going to have the same force as they would have if they're the thing that everybody in the whole culture does and has always done for thousands of years. Uh, it may take several generations for them to take root in that kind of way. So right now we're in a period that, on the one hand, has a lot of freedom for us to create those kinds of rituals and ceremonies. And on the other hand, uh, I think we're, we, we lack that kind of depth of tradition uh, that you get from a culture that passes those things down generation to generation. Let's hold on sound. Yeah. yeah. There, there's no question that um, uh, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, it's all. It's the eternal question of how can we initiate when we ourselves haven't been initiated. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, it's sort of the older generation, and that's um, and that's a problem. I mean, yeah. It's a real problem, and. We, it can't be an unsolvable problem, mm -hmm. meaning that, you know, I mean, with some people, you know, it almost becomes an excuse in my view, you know, it's like, well, you can always go off and get yourself mm -hmm. initiated or, you know, co-create something in your community so that you can at least uh, simulate the experience, mm -hmm. you know, so you have a taste of what it is so that you can then turn and create it for the youngers. Yeah. A couple of my friends uh, have sent their sons to a wonderful camp up in uh, Canada where they do a kind of rite of passage. They take them on a canoe trip across Hudson Bay, and it's very physical and very challenging. Uh, and that has served as a kind of rite of passage. And I think there are people doing that kind of work, taking kids into the wilderness, uh, teaching them those skills. Uh, that in some ways can represent that kind of challenge, you know, that might have come in a traditional society from a ceremony. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the, but there's so many different forms that those challenges yeah. can take, you know. Um, so I know uh, go ahead. one of my friends, when... I was very close to her and her sons, and when her boy reached that age of puberty, he was totally not open to any kind of ritual or ceremony. And his father wasn't in the picture at all, and there wasn't like a man uh, to, that she was close to to do something. And I thought about what could we do for him, and I took him river rafting, you know, and uh, just you know, as a kind of like, let's do something that's secular, but that gives you a sense of, oh, challenge that we're going to face and we're going to go down the river together. And at the end of it, you come out and you're a little bit different than you were when you went in. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and again, I mean, you sort of alluded to this, but, you know, so much of it's about intention. Yeah. Right? Our willingness to consecrate the moment and make it sacred, you know, and then reflect that sacredness, that awareness back to the young person. You know, that's, that's, mm -hmm. there's so many opportunities in everyday life for that, but they're just, nobody's mm. taking them up. Yeah. You know? Well, you want to respond to that or should I just ask something else? Yeah, I know other women who, when their daughters came to that first menstruation, they were like, t again, totally like, don't tell anyone, no, we're not, you know, very, very embarrassed about it. And where maybe they couldn't do a ceremony like we might do, but 
they would bring them a bunch of red roses or take them out to dinner as a way of celebrating and honoring that. Yeah, sweet. Yeah, what you were talking about earlier about the ceremony that yeah. you did for your young, uh, I don't know whether to call them young women or girls, yeah. but huh? whatever. Uh, I was lucky enough to be with some friends in Melbourne, Australia uh, two years ago, and their 14-year-old you uh -huh. know, had a rite of passage, and I was there for the celebrate, the community celebration. Uh -huh. And all of the women in her extended family had written in a book uh, all of what they wished their mothers had told them. When they oh, were yeah. Uh -huh. Just some valuable life lessons, and they gave her this beautiful book. You know, to, to uh -huh. again, and it was a, it was just a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. So anyway, that that's what uh -huh. we're talking about here. That's what's needed. Uh, let's talk about boys and girls okay. and the differences between them. You know, my feeling is that it's actually more important now, sort of culturally, historically, for desperate for mm -hmm. desperation reasons, to initiate boys. Uh huh. And it's partly because we still have a largely patriarchal system and those boys will become the suspended adolescents at 40, 50, 70 yeah. with their hands on the levers of power in government and in corporations and elsewhere that if they're not initiated can do a hell of a lot more harm than girls. That's one reason, but I think there's others. I'm curious about your thoughts about that. I think it is important to initiate young boys and uh, young men um, because I think a lot of men's distress uh, comes from just this sort of unresolved sense about how do I become myself? How do I become, what does it mean to be a man? How do I become a real man? And we live in a culture where you're told really what a real man is supposed to be is hard and unfeeling and... Uh, you know, a rapist and a killer and an aggressive and all of those, you know, cold and cutthroat and all of those things which are tremendously destructive and damaging, first to the world around, secondly to the women they encounter, and thirdly to themselves, you know. So I think it's important to have something that counters that and allows men uh, and people of mixed fluid gender, you know, to connect and say, oh, you don't have to be, you know, all those things to be a man. You know, you can be nurturing, you can be loving. Those are parts of what being a man really is about. And uh, I also think it's important for girls, you know, to also be challenged to say, oh, it's not just about always taking care of everybody. You know, you can have adventures, you can uh, f face physical challenges, you know, you can be assertive, you can put your mind on a goal and follow it and direct it and be focused on it for yourself. Uh, those are, you know, after all the years of feminism and everything, those are still issues that we have to deal with with our young people. Yeah, yeah, they're not going away. And yeah. I think in some ways boys are more confused today than they were 20, 30 years ago, even. Uh, it's really a shame because there's so few models of mature masculinity that exist mm -hmm. in society for them to attach themselves to. So few, and, and almost none that are held up in the popular culture. Yeah. So that's another problem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's interesting, Robert Bly introduced me to that concept uh -huh. of the male mother, the archetype of the male mother. The sort of that nurturance yeah. you know, that exists in men that has to be awakened. Yeah. It's exactly along the mm -hmm. lines of what you're saying. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, so, um, so talk about the goddess movement if, and, and how rites of passage fit in, fits in, especially regarding teens. Um, yeah, the goddess movement, you could say, started in this country 
a lot in the 70s and the 80s uh, with those of us who discovered feminism, who were looking at questions of gender and power, and started to question our religious models and our spiritual models to say, you know, what would it be like if we saw a deity, if we saw a spirit as female, not always as male? And has there ever been a culture that viewed spirit in that way? And uh, we discovered that yes, in fact, there are at the root of even European civilization, you know, there are cultures that honored the female sacred, the goddess, uh, not as separate from the male, not excluding the male, but really honoring that principle of life uh, and that the life giver and the nurturer is the ground of what sustains and supports all of our lives and has to be uh, cared for, has to be seen as sacred, as really important. Uh, I think those societies also honor those qualities that have been ascribed to women. I don't think they're unique to women, but those qualities of nurturing and caring and caring for the next generation. I think our society very much does not care for those qualities. We relegate them um, you know, to being irrelevant, you know, to the bottom line or the profit. And as a result, we're destroying the very life support systems that do sustain our lives. Um, so, what was the question again? I think well, I've gotten Well, just about this sort of yeah. how the goddess movement, how that sort of filters back through these issues of yeah. teen initiation in particular. Yeah, so for those of us who got involved in the goddess movement, you know, for me, I've been involved in it since I was a teenager, you know, in, in my early 20s. We've now, like, lived a life that has been informed by that kind of spirituality, that kind of movement. We've raised children. Uh, many of us now have raised grandchildren. We've seen uh, the movement take root. So we've had the opportunity to... Uh, say, hmm, well, if we believe this stuff, well, well, what do we do with our own teenagers? <laughs> uh, what do we do with our young girls when they begin to menstruate? What do we do with our young boys when they start to mature? Shouldn't we honor that in some way? And that's really how we came up with the ceremonies that we do for our teenagers. You know, to get back to what I was mm -hmm. saying earlier about, you know, uh, why boys may need it even more than yeah. girls, I think it's partly because of menstruation and the mm -hmm. fact that even if it's not celebrated, if it's not consecrated, girls have that biological right of initiation. And boys, I believe, unconsciously crave a blood right of initiation. Mm. You know, they need to be able to spill blood and to see it in order to touch their own mortality, mm. you know. Um, I don't know if you want to respond to that at all. But. Um, I haven't really thought about whether boys actually need to see and touch blood to confront their own mortality, but it makes sense to me. And I think, uh, you know, I also have a ranch where we raise meat. We raise chickens and sheep. And that requires you to be part of that whole cycle of life and death. Uh, and I think, you know, there was a time when most people lived on farms and kids saw death all the time and participated in it. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that it is actually a very sacred act when you're growing your own food uh, to be part of saying, you know, to an animal, or to a bird, or to a chicken, or something. Okay, now it's the time when mortality has come. And we honor you, we always do it with prayer and with offerings. Uh, and uh, I think if young people actually were part of that, they might actually grasp something about life and death that I think becomes very abstract in our society, where on the one hand, they're immersed in images of violence all the time, uh, where violence is made a game, where the video games are all about killing and shooting, you know, where they 
are eager to join the military, some of them, because they think it's a great adventure, whatever, but where they never actually have to confront what does it mean to have something that's alive one moment and dead the next, and what does that mean about death that we're all going to have to face? Well, it's so interesting. I, I don't know why. Yeah. Uh, another thing <laughs> that yeah. I talked about when I interviewed mm -hmm. him was he said that's essential for initiation, uh -huh. that you have to uh, be brought to your own mortality. Mm -hmm. You have to fear death, basically, and that that challenge yeah. that we talk about so well has to bring you to that threshold where at least you may not be physically endangered of losing your life, but at least psychically, you have to fear that that yeah. could happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, I think you're, you're so right about what you say. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, you know, I work with a lot of young people in the inner city, and a lot of young guys that encounter death all the time. Like, not one of them, and the girls too, like there's no young person in that community who hasn't lost someone to violence uh, in their family, someone they're close to, a boyfriend, a friend, you know, so they do encounter that kind of mortality. They're very aware of how close death is, um, but at the same time, it's not in the sense of a rite of passage, you know, it's in the sense of I think being thrown into a very cruel and vicious world without much support for how do you deal with it, how do you negotiate it, how do you make other choices that might, are there any other choices that might lead you out of this into something better? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's why in some ways I, I tend to think that, you know, um, gangbangers you mm -hmm. know, can be some of the easiest yeah. young people to initiate because often they have already been initiated yeah. and they already have touched death so many times mm -hmm. so it's really just taking redirecting their energies really yeah in a sense yeah that's that's the other thing that's really missing in my understanding of a lot of gang initiation there's there's no elders yeah. Uh -huh. There's no elders, and so you don't have that fundamental wisdom mm -hmm. to direct those energies in, in community building ways rather than community destructive ways. Yeah. I think young people crave elders. I know a lot of them uh, are always telling me, you know, they crave elders. On the other hand, because they haven't had elders or grown up in a society with elders, uh, what they often don't realize is that when you have elders, your elders are going to actually tell you how to behave, right? <laughs> that they're not just, you know, a nice, wise people sitting in a room saying, oh, you're wonderful. You know, they're actually going to, like, chew you out and uh, tell you, you know, what you need to be doing and um, bursting your little bubbles. And so I think sometimes when they get elders, they're not too, actually too happy <laughs> with it. Right, or they'll want to consciously push back against yeah. them and just reject uh -huh. them. Because I know I did that for most of my adolescence uh -huh. in my 20s. But it's like the story of the South African elephants. Uh -huh. You know, all how they had all of the, the young elephants. You know this story? No, or, I don't. Yeah. Well, they, they, they tried to repopulate these, um, these national parks uh -huh. with elephants that had been depleted of them. So they brought all of these younger elephants into the park mm -hmm. but they didn't they didn't bring any elders uh -huh. and so the young elephants would go berserk and they just were totally unmanageable and they start attacking people uh -huh. and they start uh -huh. knocking over trees and start uh, breaking down fences etc so they brought in some bulls and some other older elephants yeah. and it totally cooled them out uh -huh. amazing uh -huh. but it did so and that's yeah. elephants uh -huh. Yeah, it's a wonderful story. You can just Google it yeah. and, and find it. There's some YouTube clips out there about it. Well, let's talk about that for a minute since we're talking about eldership. So, uh, because to me, well, initiation, I've heard one person describe mm -hmm. as practice eldership. Uh -huh. and, and to my way of thinking, eldership and initiation, I mean, mentorship and initiation are sort of two halves of one whole. Uh -huh. And both are really necessary for 
the maturation of an individual's psyche into wholeness and community. Um, I mean, is that your understanding at all? Or what, how do you relate those mm -hmm. two, if you do at all? Uh, for me, being an elder is a some slightly different stage than just being an adult. Uh, you know, that adolescent rite of passage is into adulthood, into agency, into that period of time where you're learning competencies and masteries and you're doing things and you're contributing things and building things and making things and shaping things. Uh, and eldership is really about where you make that shift from doing it and shaping it and making it to saying, how do I pass on these skills? How do I pass on these abilities to another generation? How do I make sure that what I make is going to actually extend after me? So the mentorship is, can be part of just the adult phase, but it also very much is part of that elder phase. And uh, I think it's great for teens and elders to have each other, um, you know, so that you can get that mentorship and so that when you are in that phase, you actually have that sense of, oh, there are young people coming after me. You know, there are people who are going to carry on something I have done. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just it's so glaring, you know, mm -hmm. that we ghettoize both ends of yeah. the age spectrum. You know, the young are kind of running wild, doing their own thing. You know, the elders are all ghettoized and... Uh, assisted living homes and whatever, uh -huh. and and the and the ones in the middle are absent because they're running around trying to make a living, working three jobs, and you know trying to keep their head above water. Uh, and and that to me would solve so many problems, mm -hmm. just bringing the elders and the youngers back together. Uh huh. Yeah, you sort of touched on this earlier, but I'd like to circle back to it. Uh, you know, to my way of thinking, uh, initiation is one of the last great hopes against consumerism. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, t you know, God, it's just that the value in life is somehow found through consumption. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the great lie that we all live with. And if and talk about if you, if you agree with that statement. And talk about how you see rites of passage and mentorship as the antidote to consumer society. I think when you have a rite of passage, it gives you a sense of value of who you are and how you're valued. That's you know separate from all the trappings in our society. It says you're you know you're worthy if you got the right clothes or the right shoes or the right you know gadgets or the right house. You know, you're less dependent on needing those external markers of success and worth because you have a sense of your own worth. Uh, you have an internal sense of your worth that stays with you. Yeah, and that internal sense of worth functions positively in so many different ways uh, throughout mm -hmm. the course of a, a person's life. I mean. Uh, one of them is just in facing succeeding challenges mm -hmm. that occur too. Um, yeah, no, no, that's a really good way of putting it. Okay. Um, yeah, I live in the country a lot of the time, and when you're out in the country where we are, we're off the grid, you know, our electrical system, our water system, everything is kind of self-maintained. And that has been a sort of initiation for me. Uh, you know, you realize... You're originally a city girl. Yeah, as a city girl and as somebody who wasn't really even brought up, I didn't even have a father or anyone in the family that knew anything about how to fix things or do things. Uh, my basic attitude when something goes wrong tends to be like, oh my God, we're doomed, you know, right? And uh, yet what I see is that people who are good with those things, uh, their attitude when something goes wrong is, oh, let's find out what's wrong and we can fix it. 
and uh, that confidence that you can face something and you can find out the answer. And I've gained a lot more of that, just partly by necessity and partly from watching and learning. But I think that, that that's a confidence that goes with a lot of people who do grapple with physical reality, you know, who are farmers or who are mechanics or who are carpenters or who are those people that do that work in our society. And I think that that has also been very much part of those rites of passage in traditional cultures where everybody constantly had to grapple with aspects of physical reality. And I think it is something that we could build in more to our rites of passage for our young people. Into the challenges that we offer them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's sort of what Angelis Arian said. You yeah. know, it's just about a, a, a acquiring skills uh -huh. at a certain level. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, my parents were Jewish. Uh -huh. percent. My father German, mother Russian, and uh, uh, basically the unspoken lesson for my life was: Hey, do anything you absolutely want, just don't ever do it with your hands. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know. Use your mind, you know, yeah. think, think about it, but don't, you know, no, no, no. <laughs> and believe me, that still is a handicap yeah. to this day. Uh -huh. like I know. Exactly. <laughs> There's no joke. And, yeah. and Marina as well. There's no joke. Okay. Um, let's see here. What have we covered? Yeah. Uh, you know, You've sort of touched on this, but you know, I think it really is important that you know women initiate girls, men initiate boys mm -hmm. at, a some, at a certain level, and and yet, of course, after that, subsequent to that initiation, they obviously have to be brought back together again. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, talk about, if you will, what you see of the role of women in the initiation of boys and vice mm -hmm. versa, the role of men in the initiation of girls? I think it's really important um, that we're all involved in the initiation of our young people. Uh, I think they need role models who are like them to take them through those mysteries, but they also need, you know, I think young boys need to know that women can actually affirm and respect their maleness and hold that sacred and I think young girls need to know that men can affirm their womanness and hold that sacred uh, and now we see our young people a lot of them are just questioning gender altogether or deciding that you know because they have to be born with a woman's body that they're really a boy or the other way around and I think that they need uh, maybe even more so to know that the whole spectrum of people in the community can affirm them for whoever they are, whatever their choices are, whatever their uh, you know ultimate sense of identity settles on being, uh, that um, their community holds them as sacred beings and. Yeah, it's, I, I saw that uh, mm -hmm. demonstrated to me when I was making my last film, Journey from Zanzibar, uh -huh. with the Tibetan community. And, you know, there was a, a young person there who mm -hmm. basically they said, yeah, well, she was born a girl, but now she's a boy. Uh-huh, yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> oh, okay. And it was just like, they are saying, you know, pass the water. Yeah, <laughs> right. Very, just matter of fact, uh -huh. and totally accepting, you know. I thought, wow. Yeah. Light years beyond yeah. where we are. Um, you know, one of the things uh, that Warren Farrell has said, do you know mm. his work at all? Not He's a writer about men and masculinity. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, he argues that historically men were initiated in order to make them warriors, mm -hmm. basically, so that they could go, you know, to battle on behalf of the village. And... Uh, I have my own <laughs> problem uh -huh. with that, but I'm curious about your response to that idea. 
I don't think traditional initiations were only about being warrior, so though certainly there were warrior initiations. Um, but again, thinking about my friend Charlie and his stories about his village in Africa, they were really about becoming whoever you were meant to be in terms of your contribution to the society, to the community. And, um, you know, I do think there's an aspect of initiation that is about being willing to face danger, being willing to put yourself at risk maybe for, a, for the community's benefit. Um, but I don't think it's limited to the warrior. And not every traditional society was a warrior society. You know, uh, there are many, many traditional cultures that where people who were honored were the peacemakers and the ones who could keep the peace. Yeah, nice. Um, you know, our, our culture places so much emphasis these days, and especially being in the Bay Area, on uh, what I would call spirit work. You know, mm -hmm. this sort of broadly stated new age culture does. And, you know, to me, the big shadow, mm -hmm. if you will, you know, what's missing in that is soul work. Mm -hmm. You know, and the way that I think of it is, you know, soul work is, is down. Uh -huh. You know, it's, it's going into the earth and it's going into the, 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 the blood and guts of your own traumatic experiences in life and rooting the, them out to you know your own woundedness if you will and that in order to do the outward upward work of spirit you have to have the good strong roots of soul work mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious if you uh, how that resonates with you those ideas I've never really thought of spirit as just being outward and upward uh, for me it's always about connecting to the earth and I think that's part of that sense of being connected to the goddess being connected to earth-based spirituality you know spirit comes from the same root as breath and breath is a drawing in of that air into the body and you know, as well as the letting out right but it's that flow in and out it's not about escaping the body uh, it's about supporting and sustaining the body uh, so I think of something as being sacred, not as being out of the world or removed from the world, but about being what you really most care about, what you most, uh, what's most deeply important to you. Important enough you'd put it above your own comfort or profit. You, know, that you might take a risk for it, you might take a stand for it. And uh, for me, I always challenge those metaphors that get embedded in our spiritual dialogues about high and light and you know people who call themselves light workers it's like excuse me there's no light without dark <laughs> and can we look at how those metaphors reinforce racism and reinforce prejudice against darker people uh, and there's no fertility without earth that's dark you know the darker it is the more fertile it is you know, in the old uh, goddess cultures in Western Europe or Eastern, or the old goddess cultures of old Europe, white was the color of death and black was the color of birth and life. Because white was the color of bone and dark is the color, again, of fertile soil. So I think we need to look at all of those metaphors and to recognize that uh, anytime you try to go in one direction, exclusive of the other, you know, all light, no dark, or all high and no low, you know, or all out there in the spirit and no body, uh, you often end up doing terrible things to other people in their bodies, <laughs> uh, oppressing other people who look different from you. Um, you know, those uh, shadow aspects tend to come up and bite you in the butt, really. <laughs> Or when they don't even kill people outright. Like, I'm thinking yeah. about that guy in Arizona getting those people in a sweat lodge, you know? Yeah. I mean, Jesus. <laughs> that stuff drives me crazy. Um, uh, if you would, I'd be curious to hear you speak 
even in sort of bullet point form to what you think are kind of the key aspects of successful mentorship relationships? Um, I think uh, the key aspect of being a good mentor, um, one is actually having some knowledge or having some experience or even having some wisdom to pass on. Uh, so that you actually have some earned authority, that you have uh, paid your dues, you know, you've lived your life, you've put the work in so that you actually really do have something you can pass on. Secondly, I think your mentoree has to actually be willing to invest some authority, to accept that somebody else actually does maybe know more than they do, uh, somebody else might actually have some wisdom that they don't yet have and be willing to accept that. Um, and uh, thirdly, I think mutual respect is part of it, that you respect each other, uh, that you respect the person you're mentoring, uh, that you are caring about them, you're really thinking about them and really thinking about how to create an experience that can actually benefit them, uh, can help them to grow. Um, to me, those are some of the key aspects. Beautiful. Yeah, thank you. It's really helpful. Um, I'm just about I guess I could add one more. Yeah, say, yeah, please. You know, to be a good mentor, a good teacher, um, you have to be able to critique your students, but I think you can learn to do it in ways that build self-esteem and build, you know, are supportive rather than are tearing somebody down. And I run into this all the time because I'm often teaching people, you know, physical things like how you plant a seed or how you make, how you prune a tree or you know how you make cob and there's an art to it, especially if you're working, like we work a lot of times with kids from the projects, kids whose self-esteem is so low that you don't always want to be saying, no, that's wrong, no, that's wrong, no, that's wrong. You know, and yet, if it is wrong, <laughs> the plant's not going to grow and they're going to not have success. So uh, I've learned, you know, to try to even make those criticisms in a supportive way. So it might rather than saying, you know, Armin, you just blasted those carrots and killed them with that water, you know, what the hell were you thinking of? You know, I would say something more like, Armin, I know that you're really a smart guy. I know you're really capable of looking at what you're doing, thinking about it, observing it. So let's look at what happened to those carrots when you hit them with that blast of water. Where are they now? Or do you think they're going to grow? Um, you know, how do you think you could have done that differently? What do you think we can do now to try to revive them and save them? And I find that that works much, much better. Uh, not just with kids, you know, who are struggling with low self-esteem, but really there's nobody who really likes to be told, that was wrong, that was stupid, oh no, why'd you do that, you idiot? I think we all respond better to people treating us with respect and encouraging us to actually look and observe and take responsibility for what we do. I couldn't agree more and you know it's, it just drives me crazy yeah. that you know when I see parents even my own sister yeah. it's like 97 percent of the time you're saying no to yeah. your daughter when do you say yes yeah. to her when do you say yes and part of that equation to me is about blessing mm -hmm. and we you know, uh, I don't remember who it was, but you know, maybe, maybe it was Michael Mead. You know, when I talked to him, he said, "You know, our society is, is especially men, is the walking wounded. You know, all of these men looking unconsciously for their father's blessing, somebody to mm -hmm. see them and say yes to them. I see you and bless you for mm -hmm. who you are. You know, uh, boy, is that missing." <laughs> I don't know if you want to yeah. on that or... Yeah, I think on the one hand, young people both are, on the one hand, overindulged, and on the other hand, not really truly validated. 
you know, so often, you know, they're constantly being told how wrong they are, how dumb they are, how stupid they are, or the mistakes that they've made. And on the other hand, a lot of times, uh, you know, parents aren't really giving them the kind of boundaries and discipline and limits that they really need and crave. You know, so uh, I think it's hard. You know, I think it works really well with young people when they feel respected, when they feel like uh, you see them, you see their possibilities, you see what they can become, you honor that, you are held there to support that, and at the same time, uh, you're not going to put up with bad behavior. You know, you're going to set boundaries and clear boundaries and hold those boundaries. Um, oftentimes they'll test that, but when you do hold them, I think they feel much more secure. My experience is always yeah. they'll test yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, do you have any questions? I'll be just about out of time. Yeah. Out of what? Question resource? Uh, just about. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I had one thought. Yeah. yeah. I still want to address your eyesight better, of course. But uh -huh. um, you talked a lot, or you, you touched on the subject of when young people are resistant. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps the elders in their life feel that they're ready, or perhaps they're physically uh -huh. reaching a point of readiness that, you know, that everyone recognizes. Um, I'm just a little more curious to know what your experience and maybe even strategies are when the youth are continually resistant, hmm. you know, outside of just, say, waiting. Yeah. Because you know? if, if um, you know, like a particularly stubborn young person might just try to wait them out. Yeah. You know, and so, so it never happens. I would say in our community, um, if young people are really resistant, oftentimes we do just wait them out. And if they wait too long, sometimes they don't get the initiation or they don't get the ritual or the ceremony. I'm not always sure if that's the right thing or not. I mean, when I grew up, you had to go to temple whether you wanted to or not, <laughs> right? Or you had to go to Hebrew school. Uh, and. Most of the time we were resistant, but or especially to go to temple. But on the other hand, it, there was a sense of this is something that's really important. You know, you you do it, and it's important to all of us, and you do it. And sometimes I think we're because most people in our community are kind of have come from some other tradition and don't want to be in that authoritarian position. We haven't inflicted that on our young people. And um, that's probably a good thing. You know, there's just sort of no way being who we are that we could say you have to go to the ritual whether you want to or not, you know, because goddess will strike you dead if you don't, <laughs> because we don't believe that. Um, but I think they do miss some of that sense of like, hey, this is actually something that, at least to us, is really vitally important. And if you don't do it, you're missing out on it. Yeah, that, you know, yeah. I mean, most kids didn't have a choice. Right? Yeah. In history, it's like, now's your time, yeah. you're coming with us. You yeah. Know? Right? Mm -hmm. And now, you know, we live in such a right success yeah. uh, society that. Uh, it's a tough nut. It's yeah. a really tough nut with young people. When they're stuck in that fuck you stage, yeah. you know, it's mm -hmm. really, I just want to grab them and say, you don't have a choice about this. Yeah. You're right. coming, you know, because some of them need that. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Can be pushed. But, yeah. but it is, it's tough because, yeah. you know, then there's abuse issues and all kinds of authoritarian yeah. issues that you talk about as well, you know, and wow. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. It's tough. What I say, you know, to people when they ask me, and you know, when I give talks sometimes, mm -hmm. I say, I just try to focus on responsibilities yeah. and let rights take care of themselves. Because, uh -huh. you know, we're, we're, we are a rights-obsessed society, but we're, no, we're not really talking a lot about responsibilities. Yeah. And, and, you know, so historically that was a responsibility for adults, the older generation. Yeah. Know, to, we had to do this for our young people. I mean, I know one of my friends uh, 
Remember, she sent her kid to summer camp that I knew was a great summer camp for kids. He's a very urban city boy, New York boy. With two days, he's like, I want to come home, Mom, you know, right? I can't stand this. It's not me. She brought him home, and I keep thinking, you know, he was one kid who really needed, like, never anyone had ever taught him to be in his body or to do anything physical. And she could have sent him there and turned the phone off. <laughs> And just sometimes I think it's helpful for kids to get thrown into a situation they can't get out of and have to stick with um, because, well, again, because they're facing a world where we're all being thrown into situations that we aren't going to be able to get out of, and we need to be able to cope with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And oftentimes what kids need is exactly what their parents haven't been able to give them. And they're going to be most resistant to. Uh, but again, it's not easy to make that call. Right? Easier to do it from outside, I think, when, than from when you're the parent involved. Right? Definitely. Definitely. Well, and that's, again, I mean, that speaks to the roles of the uncles and the aunties. Yeah. You know, because it, it, Historically, as mm -hmm. I understand it, it was never the parents' decision of when their kids would be initiated. Yeah. It's the community. It's the, yeah. it's the extended family. They're the ones. And then they're mm -hmm. the ones who take responsibility for the young people. Mm -hmm. You know, Because no parent should ever have to put their own, initiate their own kid. Yeah. You know, partly because of that death issue. You yeah. Know, it's, it goes against the very essence of what parenting is for, which is to nourish life. You, know, mm -hmm. you don't want to put that life at risk through initiation. And also, you know, I think one reason why it's good to have other people in the community to do the initiation and not your parents is that you and your parents, you have patterns, you have relationships, you have the things that they can do for you and can't do for you that all come out of who they are and who you are. And somebody else is just going to have a really different set of patterns. And that can be really helpful. <laughs> uh, that sometimes can supply what's missing. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Any pattern that speaks to limitations. Yeah. You need to have those limitations exploded mm -hmm. at some level. Well, great. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. Did you have other uh, questions or thoughts? I can see. Okay. Sure. Did you have anything? That you, uh, no? Okay. Uh, what, what time do we have? Uh, Mr. Pugh. It's what? 3 p.m. 3 p.m. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wow. Okay. All right. Let me just give me, bear with me one moment. Uh -huh. I just want to double check my list here in case I missed anything. Um, yeah. While he's doing that, I can. Uh, I'd ask if you guys could shoot a little thing for me that I need for uh, oh, trying to make a promo yeah, yeah. video. Yes. And. Is that a mini DV or what do you shoot on there? It's not tape. It shoots to a media card. Oh, okay. Um, what would be the best way to do it? We could. Um, we could, um, you know, if there's a camera you usually use, you could use that. Okay. That way you've retained that here and you use it. Um, well, there's a possibility you could use this and get your footage somehow. All right. I can go get that camera. Okay. Okay. Can I keep the microphone on, or should I take um, it off? We're done. Well, I guess, yeah. Um, actually, can I ask you one more question? Sure, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it, it goes back to um, the term that I use is suspended adolescence. Uh-huh. You know, and the, how we have society run by suspended adolescence, you mm -hmm. know, stuck in that adolescent growth that they haven't matured. Um, you know, I, I wonder, I just would love to hear you speak to your correlation between the state of the planet, mm -hmm. basically, and initiation. You know, we're really facing um, such a grim moment in terms of the state of the planet right now. And some of the things, like right now, we're here on the West Coast. Uh, We've got Fukushima in Japan 
spewing out radiation. Nobody knows how much or how much is actually affecting us, partly because they aren't monitoring it. They're about to try to take the fuel rods out, and you know, there's this tremendous fear that if they don't get these rods out right and drop them, or if an earthquake happens, the whole thing could blow up. And, uh, you know, David Suzuki is saying, you know, that'll be goodbye, Japan, and we'll have to evacuate the whole West Coast. <laughs> so you're saying, how did we get in this situation? You know, what were these people thinking of? You know, like, how did we ever think as a species it was a good idea to build these things that are tremendously destructive, that nobody has any idea how to deal with when they go wrong? You know, that after 50 years of building them or more, we still have no place really to put the waste that they produce. And to me, that is immature thinking. You know, to me, mature thinking, the kind of thing your mother tells you to do or your dad is, if you're going to make a mess, you got to think first how you're going to clean it up, right? If you can't clean it up, don't make the mess, right? You know, um, we're not thinking clearly as a species. We're faced with climate change. You know, the paper today says, that we're due to hit over 400 parts per million in 2016 of carbon dioxide when 350 is what scientists generally think of as a safe zone. And we're not dealing with it at all. You know? uh, the people who are doing the tar sands, you know, there was this great thing in the news about how they admitted that the tar sands are contributing to climate change and how they are destructive to the planet, but it's irrelevant. It's like irrelevant to who, to what, you know? It's irrelevant to an adolescent that thinks they're playing a video game. It's not irrelevant to a mature human being who knows that they have some responsibility for the care of the life support systems in the planet and for leaving something to the generations that come after. So that adolescent inability to look beyond the moment or look beyond your immediate benefit or gratification, I think, is something that is very directly contributing to the demise of the planet. Yeah, thank you for saying that. Yeah, it really touched my heart. I really <laughs> appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, all right, great. Do you want it, so you want to fetch your camera? Yeah, I'll fetch my camera. Okay. Um, probably not as good as your camera, but.